Please pray with me. Gracious Lord, may the meditations of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be a pleasing offering to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I always get a kick out of this passage about the mustard seed because some biblical interpreters just... I don't think that they realize that uh, Jesus is using hyperbole here. I've actually heard some commentators try to explain, well, how does, how does this little shrub become such a great tree that, that birds are able to you know, take shade in its branches? Well, it doesn't literally the case. The mustard, seed, the mustard is a rather small little bush, so it's not a literal statement here. Jesus is making a hyperbole. You know, he's talking about the kingdom of God and how it's some, somehow it's unexpected, it's small, it's insignificant, and then somehow it grows. Because, you know, the, mustards, the mustard plant, or the plant that's referred to as mustard here in um, our text, is actually kind of what we would call over here a um, noxious weed. It just spreads all over the place, and you can't stop it, which is probably Jesus' point, right? Um, if any of you have ever had some of those Canadian thistle in your yard, you know how hard they are to get rid of. You practically want to spray them with gasoline and set them on fire. Some plants, just you can't get rid of them, which I think is really the point of the story. But it is fun to read the interpreters who, of course, they feel like they need to take everything literally. And so they have to come up with all these sort of gymnastics to figure out, well, how can this... Uh, this bush, which is really just a little bush, how can it be described as a great tree that the birds themselves take shelter in its branches when that is not actually what happens with that bush? Uh, we have three readings for today. Um, the first reading is from the prophet Ezekiel. Our second reading is from 2 Corinthians, and our gospel reading is from Mark. Now, the first passage is Ezekiel. And you might be able to pick up from the, um, from the text that it is, it is referencing a time when Judah is about to be destroyed. Um, the prophet Ezekiel was um, taken away to Babylon before the city was destroyed. So he was actually living in, writing, and ministering in Babylon during this time. But he was seeing what was happening, and he could, he could recognize the handwriting on the wall. He could see that ultimately the Judahite kingdom would be destroyed, the temple would be destroyed, the city would be destroyed, and its people would be entirely deported to Babylon. So in that context, of course, it's very easy to become discouraged, to disheartened. I think about that famous psalm that talks about, by the rivers of Babylon we wept, and ends with, some rather scary, violent image about what to do with the enemy's babies. Um, so this is a time of great sadness, despair, hopelessness. And yet, in the middle of all of that, Ezekiel is able to see a future where the nation is restored, where the Davidic monarch is back on the throne, where the great are brought down and the lowly are lifted up. With all that talk of cedars, it reminds me of some of the great groves of cedars that we have around here. Up at Priest Lake, there's the Roosevelt Grove. Uh, over, in, uh, over in North Idaho, you have the, uh, the, ancient, the Settler's Grove of ancient cedars. And of course, if you stood among those trees, they just fill you with this sense of awe because they're so large and so old. You can imagine the ancients standing in awe of these giant trees and thinking about them as being so amazing and so, just so great. But what does the prophet imagine? He imagines this little sprig of a branch being pulled off and planted and becoming a great cedar tree. In fact, it even mentions birds of every kind will nest in it and find shelter in the shade of its boughs. And then all the trees in the countryside will know that I, the Lord, bring down the tall tree and raise up the lowly tree and make the green tree wither and the dry tree bloom. You know, those who take these passages literal, I feel sorry for them because they must be wondering, why does God care what trees think? 
Again, that's probably not what the author is really literally meaning here. So there's a message here about hopefulness. Seeing a future where the nation will be restored. And notice it isn't because of anything that the nation has done. Nowhere does the prophet say, oh, I'm doing this because you've been such good and faithful servants of mine. No, that's, that's, not, that's not the words here. God is doing this merely so that the whole world will know God. That is God's rationale, and God and God alone will accomplish this. So we see that message of unmerited goodness, that gospel of grace at work here. Now, our second reading is, uh, we're continuing through 2 Corinthians. And as, as you know, Paul has been struggling with some of his opponents. He's been challenged in his authority. He has acknowledged that his life is going roughly. He's had a bunch of bad things happen to him. And yet he is, you know, being true to the faith and he just keeps pressing on. And again, we hit yet, nevertheless, Paul is encouraged. Paul is confident. He acknowledges that as Christians, we live in this sort of weird dual existence. On the one hand, we are home here in this world. On the other hand, we are also at home with the Lord. How do we live between those two worlds? What are we to do? How do we, how do we move and how do we live in confidence? And how do we do the things that we need to do, knowing that there is this great divide that runs through us? That in some ways we are torn apart because of the two homes that we belong to. How do we avoid getting discouraged, feeling hopeless, feeling lost? And the answer that Paul provides is both simple and profound. We live by faith. And it is that faith that allows us to live with confidence. It is that life of faith that allows us to lead the lives that we are called to by God, to not be discouraged, to not feel hopeless, to recognize the value and virtue of our lives, to see that, in fact, what we do has meaning in God's eyes. And Paul says that from this point on, we won't recognize people by human standards, even though we used to know Christ by human standards. That isn't how we know them now. So then, if anyone is in Christ, that person is part of the new creation. The old things have gone away, and look, new things have arrived. Once again, a word of encouragement. Yes! times can be difficult. Yes, there is this real divide between the world that we live in now and the world as envisioned in God through Jesus Christ. And we sometimes feel torn apart by that division. We're pulled in opposing directions. But we live in the confidence that comes through faith. Knowing that in God, through Jesus, this world is being made anew. That we are being made anew. That we and all that we around us are being transformed in the light of God's goodness, God's grace, and God's great loving power. And that is what we also see at work in Mark 4. Right? Jesus is telling some parables. And his parables are dealing with well, what is the kingdom of God like? What is it like? The first parable talks about the sower, right, who plants his seeds. And he doesn't, he doesn't know how his plants grow, doesn't understand the biology. He sleeps and he wakes night and day, and the seeds sprout and grow. But he doesn't know how that happens. He doesn't understand those basic natural processes. 
But nevertheless, when the plant is ready, he knows. And he goes out and he harvests his grain at the right time. Something very small and seemingly insignificant grows into something great. Have any of you ever held a wheat berry or seen a wheat berry before? Yeah, some of you have. My mama actually has her own stones for grinding. So when I was a kid, she used to grind her own whole wheat flour. So even as a little kid, I saw them. You know, they aren't really that significant. They're pretty small. And yet one of those can grow into a whole stock of wheat, which can produce a lot more seeds. And in the ancient world, and even still today, wheat is very important because it's used to make bread, the staff of life. Now, if that's not good enough, Jesus then gives another parable. He talks about the mustard seed. And again, we could go on and on about this text and how you need to understand you got some hyperbole going on here. But I think that perhaps in our own context, a better analogy would be something like Canadian thistle or Russian knapweed or, or some other noxious weed that you just can't seem to get rid of. Because in the ancient world, that part of the world, the mustard, the mustard plant was not something they grew on purpose. It was a weed and one that was really hard to get along, uh, get, get, away, get rid of. So on the one hand, you have this, Jesus loved to do this in his parables. He would compare things to something that was, you wouldn't normally make that comparison. You know, you might want to say the kingdom of heaven is like a cedar tree, right? A great cedar tree, or a great king, or an abundant field, or a grove of olives, or, you know, something that is, positive and great and strong and life-affirming, and yet he says the kingdom of God is like a weed. You can imagine his audience going, what? What are you talking about here? Imagine a lot of Jesus' parables were very confusing to his audience for that very reason. He liked to use figures of speech that flipped expectations upside down. Consider a mustard seed. It's the smallest of all seeds. On, well, again, it's not actually the smallest of all seeds. There are certainly smaller ones. But it is pretty small. And when it is planted, it spreads like wildfire. You cannot contain it. It grows across the land in a way that cannot be stopped. So here we see one thing that connects these two parables is talking about the kingdom of God and how it starts small and it grows and it grows and it grows very, very large. We also see something that Jesus likes to use a lot in his parables and that is the reversal of expectations. And the prophets like that too. We saw it also in Ezekiel with the mighty being brought down and the lowly being lifted up. Here we have the noxious weed that people are normally trying to eliminate being lifted up as a symbol of the kingdom of God. That is quite a reversal. And also acknowledging that something so tiny and so seemingly insignificant can spread and grow everywhere. And that's what the kingdom of God is like. Now, on the one hand, you could find that a little discouraging because, after all, weeds are not something we usually want growing in our yards or in our fields. But I think, again, that would be missing the point. The point is supposed to be encouraging. That is, in fact, a thread that unites all three of these texts together. Encouragement. For Ezekiel, the encouragement comes as the Babylonian armies are just about ready to destroy Jerusalem and burn the temple down to the ground. And the people don't see a future for themselves. But Ezekiel does. In the middle of a seemingly hopeless situation, Ezekiel sees a future, a great future for the nation. Encouragement is also important in 2 Corinthians because Paul acknowledges this 
tension of being pulled in two opposing directions, the home in this world and the home with the Lord, the values of this world and the values of God. Trying to live with your neighbors, trying to be faithful to your call. And the encouragement that Paul gives the people is that we live by faith. Because in the end, we know that God is going to accomplish God's goals. And we can live and rest and work in that confidence. And of course, in Mark, recognizing that the kingdom of God starts out small and yet cannot be stopped. It doesn't require people to water it. Wouldn't it be nice if weeds required being watered? Wouldn't that be nice? Oh, I don't want those dandelions to grow. I'll just stop watering them. Oh, that would be so awesome. But sadly, they don't need to be watered, do they? They just keep coming back. And that is actually good news here because the kingdom of God can't be stopped. It doesn't have to be watered. It keeps coming. It keeps growing. It keeps developing. It keeps emerging. One of my uh, professors in seminary liked to talk about um, how God was the world's future. In fact, that was the title of his book, God, the World's Future. He basically understood that we are moving towards God. God is in the future. You know, the ancients, they believed that God was in the sky somewhere. And so all their metaphors are all in that three-tiered universe, the underworld, the world, and the heavens above. That's how they understood God's transcendence, that God was physically above them. Now, at some point, probably around the time of Jesus, people started understanding, well, actually, wait a minute, God is probably not literally up in the sky. And of course, if we, we've sent people into outer space, they didn't find God up there. So we know God is not literally up in the, in the sky. But my professor, he argued that instead of seeing it as a vertical axis with the world and then God in the heavens above, you need to put it on its side and understand that we are the present, but God is the future. And that's actually how God is transcendent, because God is the future. We are moving towards God. And the day will come when everything around us, this world and everything, will be absorbed and brought into God, which can also be called what, Lori? Omega point. The omega point. Yeah, sorry, Lori. I thought you'd have it right on your tongue. But yes, the omega points, this place where everything that we know and live in and value and love is brought into final completion in God. And that knowledge that God is the future is what allows us to live today. And the beautiful thing about it is That God doesn't just stay in the future. I know so many people would probably prefer God to stay in the future because when God pops into our world, God kind of throws us for a loop. Things change. Ideas, cultures, practices, relationships. And when that happens, I'll teach you another word here, prolepsis. Prolepsis is when the future breaks into our world in little bits and pieces. And those are things that we see all the time around us. It kind of reminds me of Fred Rogers talking about when he was a kid. Do you remember the story and how it was so easy to be discouraged when you saw all the terrible things happening in this world? Do you remember this story? Do you remember what his mom told him to do? What's that? Look for the helpers. That's right. Look for the helpers. And that is what we're doing. That's prolepsis. That is when God is breaking into our world in those little bits and pieces in the here and now. Those are moments where God is revealed. To the ancients, we could see that Jesus was a revelation of God from the future, right? God was reaching back from the future and popping Jesus into our world. And that action does not stop with Jesus, it continues now when we look for the helpers, when we see those little stories of of goodness and salvation, even in the midst of a dark and scary world, prolepsis is God 
breaking into our world, and we can use those moments to give ourselves the confidence that we need. We can use those moments to build our faith, to give us the courage, the strength to go on. Because otherwise, the future seems a little too distant, seems out of our minds, wondering whether or not, am I even going to live that long? But those moments still break into our world here and now. As disciples, we have this very, very distinct practice. And what is it every Sunday we do? Communion. And oh, wait a minute, what is communion? Oh, is communion perhaps an example of prolapsus where God breaks into our present from the future? Yes, it is. And that's why when we talk about communion, not only we talk about Jesus and his life and death and resurrection, but we also talk about thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because we are acknowledging that in this ceremonial meal, not only the, the past of what has happened, but seeing in that past events of the future, recognizing that the future is still breaking into our world, God is the world's future. And as so, God, like the mustard seed, cannot be stopped. You might be able to stamp them out in this field, but guess what? They're going to pop up in the next field ever, out, out next door. It's so much like the whack-a-mole game, isn't it? You just hit one and they pop up somewhere else. Or, you know, you're trying to get dandelions out of your front yard and you find out that your neighbor doesn't like to use poisons on his yard, so they start popping up over there. And you're like, dang it, they're going to come back to my yard soon, aren't they? And it's easy to find that a little discouraging. But again, this is an example of God's future breaking into our world. It can't be stopped. It's not going to always go in a straight line. Because we know that things happen. Journeys get interrupted. Destinations get changed. Directions have to be adapted by what's on the ground. You're driving to a place for vacation. You find out there's road construction. You have to get off the highway and drive along following those orange arrows. You don't know where they're going. And at some point, you're like, wait a minute. Did I, did I go on the wrong turn somewhere? Because I'm a long ways from the interstate. But then you follow and suddenly, oops, there you are. You're back where you need to be. God, the world's future, is that hope. God's, the world's future, is what allows us to live the lives that we need to, to be faithful. It's easy to become discouraged. You know, our church is in a challenging place right now, isn't it? And maybe we can identify a little bit with the people of Judah who are sitting there in Jerusalem with the Babylonian army about ready to destroy their city and destroy their temple. Perhaps we can identify a little bit with that, wondering about, do, do we have a future? But we do. It may not look quite what we're used to. There will definitely be something that we won't expect. But we can rest assured knowing that our future is with God. And that no matter what, those mustard seeds are going to keep spreading. That God's working in this world, regardless of what's happening right now in our situation. And that gives us hope and encouragement. That allows us to live the lives we need to. Because it's kind of hard to make the right choices if you think what you're doing doesn't ultimately make any difference. But it does. God, the world's future, tells us that we are being drawn towards God, pulled towards that omega point in time and space, and that that's where we're going. That's our final destination. And in that, we can find encouragement and hope. Amen. Amen.